unmute myself there. Ta-da! We are live around the world. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all of our friends around the community. Um, we're excited today for a very, very special edition. We have our good friend Julie Lerman with us today. And Julie, uh, just go ahead and give the world an introduction to who you are and what you're about and what you're working on, what excites you. Oh, all right. First of all, I'm very excited at the moment because I think Cam just said the music we were just listening to that I thought maybe it was Dave Brubrecht was his own music is I mean yeah, is, yeah, yeah. sorry but I mean I don't play piano like that I mean that the, the there's there's a lot going on there that's not like I'm that's not like my music directly but yeah I, I produced all that Holy smokes. That's it's awesome. I thought it was Dave Brubeck. Honestly, <laughs> that was amazing. Well, oh, yeah. anyway, so yeah, I am somebody who knows Dave Brubeck music at least, although <laughs> I'm not a huge, huge uh, expert in, in jazz music. So anyway, so uh, yeah, hi, I'm Julie Lerman. Um, I am in Vermont. I'm actually indoors right now. This is a green screen picture, but this really is a picture of my front yard. Although right now it's filled with uh, fall colors. Um, it's it's really beautiful, but I didn't have a quick picture to put there. Um, so I am a software coach, longtime developer. I've been uh, programming um, for you know over 30 years and I uh, do... Um, now I do a lot of coaching um, and some coding, of course, still, because like, how can you not? And um, I also do, uh, I've written a whole lot of books on Entity Framework and created a lot of courses for Pluralsight, mostly on Entity Framework. I'm actually right now, I'm actually working on two courses at once, updating uh, the old Domain Driven Design course that Steve Smith and I created and also updating my uh, getting started with the EF Core course for EF Core 5. Oh, that's a ton of stuff. First of all, Vermont looks absolutely beautiful. That's an amazing picture of your, your front lawn. Um, but so tell us more about developing courses for Pluralsight. That seems like a, an adventure, but also writing books. Like you, it seems like you do it all. Like. 30 no, years of experience. I don't do That's... it all at once. <laughs> <laughs> it's just over all that time, I've right. been able to do those things. So yeah, I, um, I actually, when Entity Framework first came out, I saw it actually before it came out, before it was even called an Entity Framework. Um, and I had never used an ORM before, so I thought it was pretty cool. And I spent a lot of time working with it even before it had been uh, before it had been released. And Microsoft had uh, got around a few times already with ORMs and pulled them, never released them. So most people were like, eh, pff, right? So, but I was like, oh, this is kind of cool and kind of interesting. So they actually released it and everybody else had been ignoring it. So I was suddenly the worldwide expert. <laughs> As, as I remember, ah. as I remember, the one that, that Microsoft had at the time that was that, that, that was the the big deal was linked to SQL, and now well, th that's not even a thing anymore. Yeah, it's still there. So the story behind that was they both got released about the same time. Um, Link to SQL came out of the C Sharp team because they had created Link and said, "Hey, you know, you know, we could use this for for uh, data." So it was this nice, sweet, little lightweight thing. At the same time, um, the data team, which is really, they were more, um, uh, you know, like ADO.net, right? And they were more owned by the SQL Server team back then. Any framework had actually come out of Microsoft Research. And so they started evolving that. And then they both kind of released it at the same time and went, oh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> yeah so anyway uh i'm sure there was a little bit of politics behind there so i'm just not going to go any further with that story <laughs> that's a perfect story though um so why don't we jump into our checkup real quick that actually relates to our topic of discussion for today which is uh entity framework <laughs> So uh, today's checkup doc 
let me throw up the URL, is actually, um, so this is something that Scott Addy and I wrote. Um, gosh, how long ago did we write this? It was, I don't know, it was last year or sometime. Um, and we've updated it a few times since then. But this is a persistent retrieve relational data with Entity Framework Core. It's a Microsoft Learn module. And you can get to it. You can see the URL uh, scrolling across the bottom, aka.ms slash learn dash EF dash core. And it seemed like an apropos uh, uh, document to discuss today for the checkup, since we have Julie. Um, what this is, if you go to this URL, you'll see uh, that you know we give you a little you know learning objectives and so forth, and then we give you an editor, right? That you can use this editor to um, to actually walk through the the content here and and get set up using Entity Framework Core in a project in an actual project that's running in Azure Cloud Shell. So this is pretty cool. You actually get hands-on experience. You don't have to download anything. You don't have to, um, uh, you know, download any any sample projects or NuGet packages or anything like that. It's all taken care of you. And by the time it's done, you should hopefully know how to wire up Entity Framework at at least a basic level in your app. That's awesome. And uh, I'm just going to throw this up here real quick. Uh, Cheeky Chappy1234, which is an amazing username. But in addition to that, they specified that they learned uh, EF6 from Julie's books, which are, you know, that's a, that's a great source for learning. So if you've got Microsoft Learn, you've got Julie's books. I know, Julie, um, you've mentioned Pluralsight before. Uh, do you have Pluralsight courses on Entity Framework as well? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Quite so a few. We, we should probably share some of those links for our consumers so that they can, um, uh, you know, follow up and look into those. Yeah. I'll uh, actually have a bit.ly link. I'll go grab that while you're doing, okay. uh, showing your stuff. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, this uh, learn module, uh, I'll throw the URL up there again, uh, aka.ms slash learn dash EF core takes maybe 45 minutes to an hour of your time, but it's all in the cloud. You don't have to download anything. You don't have to do anything locally. Uh, and when it's done, you get a cool little achievement badge that Scott and I helped design. So um, that, that makes it all worth it, right? Awesome. That's so cool. Um, and one thing for our uh, viewers of the live show, uh, if we don't have links right now, we will always have a uh, too long, don't read follow up dev two post where we'll share a summary of all the good things we've discussed here, uh, along with, you know, relative links and stuff like that. All right. So uh, want to hop into the hallway track? Let's Dave. do it. I'm excited to have Julie this week. Um, cause Julie, you and I hung out a little bit um, back in 2016 at Build, right? Rachel Apple was dragging me around to like everybody and all the social events and introducing me to everybody. And I met like you that week and uh, Michelle LaRue Bustamante and someone else that I've been listening to and following for like years. And I was all like, ah, I can't believe it. I'm actually meeting this person. <laughs> um. So just in case she ever watches this, I just want to give a shout out to Rachel Appel. <laughs> <laughs> she told me, look, she introduced herself to me. Now, in, in my defense, she and I are good friends. We talk like, I don't know, a couple of times a week on, on like Facebook. Um, she introduced herself to me as Rachel Apple. So the oh, fact that I God. mispronounced okay. her name so is she, her fault. She, yeah, <laughs> that is her fault. So yeah, she was definitely pawned you there. <laughs> We actually had her on the show recently too, didn't we? I mean, it was yeah. probably a month or so ago. Shout out to Rachel. We miss yeah, you. Rachel. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Anyway, yeah, build. Gosh, it's been you're traveling. Whoa. Meeting, seeing each other in real life. Whoa. What, what, what is, what is that? that? Yeah, what exactly. Is that? Oh, so <laughs> weird. I, I have to say though, I mean, I, I travel a lot and speak at a lot of conferences. Love it. I, I love to be able to do that. But it has been an amazing thing to be home and be in Vermont like throughout the summer and, you know, gets work done also, but um, kind of, you know, enjoying my lifestyle here and riding my bike and getting out there. I'm like, how to do this on the green screen. I am not a weather person. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's over here and over there. Yeah. Hiking in those hills. Wait, oh, still can't do that very well. Anyway. Um, yeah. So I have to say that has also been an amazing thing, right? To 
to be here and and to kind of be in my life uh, a little bit. Oh, so, absolutely. Okay. I, I can totally relate to that. Like for me, it, it's been eye opening because I have done a lot of traveling and speaking and um, just being home now with the family. And we, I've got a, a, long, a young family of three little boys. So it's like it's it's a nice break and it's yeah. it's really great, you know, as you mentioned, I like to ride bike as well. And, you know, I've got this big back lawn and you know, being in nature and being able to get out and walk around and yeah. It's, yeah instead of in airports and air, I mean, it, you know, the whole travel thing, if we could just, you know, beam me up Scotty, like when are we going to figure that out? Like then it'll be right. okay. <laughs> then it would be fine. It's just oh. all that extra stuff. Yeah. Anyway. So, but it, but it also means missing you know, seeing the other, I'm not saying that this is my only life that I care about. I mean, that is also part of my life that's important. And, and I care about a lot seeing my friends and, and also just meeting people in the community and just being able to really connect with people in the way that you can when you're at a conference. Absolutely. And that's what the bulk of this show is about. You know, the hallway track was designed specifically to help try to fill that void. I, I recall when we started back in February, that we didn't really have this formalized segment, but now that we do, we hope that all of our viewers live are encouraged and empowered to speak up and ask questions and try to have a, an open dialogue here and think of this as like a virtual uh, open circle to where we can have uh, these conversations with our guests that we bring on. So let's let's do that right now. Uh, we did actually have uh, a comment here from um, Troy Mitchell. Uh, Hi, everyone. Uh, when would you consider using Dapper? So is this, uh, are you familiar with Dapper, Julie? Oh, he heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dapper. So Dapper is uh, an ORM written by, it's it's open source written by the team at Stack Overflow because they really needed super duper 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 high performance, right? Because they just have a little bit of data floating around there um, and they just needed to have you know not all of the kind of hoops and whistles that entity framework does magically for us in order to uh, translate uh, queries and and do all the stuff that it does in the background so dapper with dapper it's an ORM but you write you provide it with your SQL directly right so um, and so there's a lot less stuff going on. So it's much more, much more performant when, you know, it's, the, there's a balance, right? Um, making the code easier and uh, making it more performant. So Dapper is really for when perform, not just saying, oh, performance is important. It's always important, but this really extreme performance so julie let me let me back up just a little bit there just to contextualize um what we're talking about for for uh, uh for our viewers who might not be familiar can you uh, yeah i mean I, I i think we've talked about it before on the show but i'm just going to ask you because you you know you're the guest and and certainly you're the domain knowledge expert uh can you back up and just explain a little bit about what we're talking about what what we mean when we talk about orms and and how entity framework fits in that picture of orms Sure, absolutely. So um, it'll just be a little hand waving. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the so ORM first of all starts stands for Object Relational Mapper, and it goes in between your relational database, or <laughs> these days also a document database. I'll, it's it, but it's really for doing that translation between the shapes of your classes and the shape of relational data. And what it does is uh, not just EF, but an ORM, except for you know when you do need to write your own SQL, what it will do is take away a lot of that redundant, repetitive effort of writing the SQL, creating connections, executing commands, retrieving results, and then turning those results back into the objects um, not just objects, but objects and objects with relationships. So uh, for querying and also for the other way, for doing updates, inserts, deletes, um, it also does that translation. So you just give it the objects then because of what you've taught it about what your model looks like and what your database looks like, it knows how to, oh, also uh, there's 
there's database providers involved also. So um, for so uh, for you know the differences between how SQL Server uh, will write commands versus how SQLite will write commands. The providers that are extensions will will take care of that. So they so, all know how to talk to any framework. So they do the translation. They say, okay, here's this object and here's the SQL I need to write in order to perform the command that needs to go to the database. So so, so go ahead. So basically the, the the database provider level is like an abstraction level, right? It's it's like uh abstracting away like the the gooey innards of whatever database we're talking to so that as a developer i really only have to worry about like dealing with the entities in entity framework right yeah yeah so well it's a combination of entity framework and then the um the specific database providers just add that last little bit of knowledge about their particular database so uh, for example if you've got a query you've written a query in link um a, that is expressed using your classes, not your database. So you've got a query, then Entity Framework actually does a lot of work of translating that into command trees. So that's kind of inner stuff. Um, and it might go through a few iterations before it gets it down to a nice command tree. And then the, the people who create the providers, the providers understand what, the shape of a command tree will be in by the time it gets to you. So they know, you know, that's a consistent thing. So link uh, entity framework will always result in this particular style of command tree. And then the providers then write that last little bit of code to transform that command tree into the proper SQL for that particular database. Got it. Got it. So, so when, when we have the, question about you know why you know when when do i choose dapper versus entity framework and you talked a little bit about oh well you might choose dapper because it's super performant and i use that word performant i've i, I actually had uh, i can work workshop. at microsoft you're allowed <laughs> <laughs> yeah i I, well, I actually gave a workshop once where um the the customer came up to me afterwards and said hey uh you know that's not an actual word right it is now <laughs> <laughs> that's what i said um Anyway, so Dapper is uh, considered more performant. So let's talk about performance. Why? Why is that? Why? Why would so Dapper is is faster than Entity Framework because the developers provide the SQL directly and it doesn't have to do all that command tree. Yeah, there's you know. a lot less. So it's a lot less. Uh, it doesn't need to be as generic. It doesn't need to be able to handle anything that's thrown at it. Right, so there's a lot less effort that it has to go through between uh, reading a query and getting it to the database, right? And and um, and also, it there's some differences with how it handles, especially shaped data, how it handles data that's come back. Um, Entity Framework again has to go through a lot more translations to turn it back into objects because again it's got to handle anything that's thrown at it whereas uh, because dapper is less complex right um and it it knows it's always going to get sql so it doesn't have to worry about the sql it needs to assume you're giving it good sql right that's the assumption um so a lot less effort coming in and a lot less effort coming back and therefore smaller AP, you know simpler apis less logic less ch less churning it's interesting yeah and i think there's actually a, a lot of other uh, orms out there for example i i've used uh, insight.database which was an early fork i believe of dapper um, and that was considered like a, a micro orm where it was really really tiny and you know now there's different providers and things like that. So that's that's interesting. We have a question here from um, a YouTube user. I'm looking at that one too. That question. yeah. So what is attribute mapping in .NET five? Is is that something that was added for EF core stuff or are you familiar no, we've, with that? We've had um, two. So there's kind of three ways for mapping. What mapping is is um, 
entity frameworks way of comprehending how to translate the classes and uh, properties of the classes into the schema of the database, right? So the first level of that is uh, convention, the assumptions, the built-in assumptions of, of like the most normal way you probably and you know mean to do things. Your the most normal uh, possibility of what you mean. Uh, for example, an assumption that the property name maps to a column name with the exact same name, All right? So that so it's a matching name. So that's right. an assumption right, which we can override. So there's a whole set of assumptions config uh, convention, um, and then there's two ways to tweak entity frameworks comprehension of what's happening in between the two, how to translate between the two. One is through attributes that you can put right in your code, right in your classes. And the other is through a configuration API. I do not like using the attributes because like for, ex for that example, um, this is the name of my property in my class, but when you send it to the database, it goes to a column with a different name, right? That to me has nothing to do with my business logic. So I don't like putting it in there. I like putting that using the NA Frameworks APIs, configuration APIs. So only Entity Framework needs to be aware of that and think about it so that my classes are what we say persistent ignorant or persistence ignorant. They don't know anything about how they're getting persisted, you know, back and forth into the database. So, um, and the other thing to know is that the uh, availability of attributes to do these mappings is much, that's, is a much smaller set of things you can do than you can do directly in the API. The API is very, very, um, flexible. Awesome. That's a, an amazing answer. And we actually have a, a bunch more questions coming in. So ah! I'm going to throw up another one, which is not a problem. That's a good thing. That's, we like, good. we yeah. like the Hi, engagement. Everybody. <laughs> uh, hi, so could, <laughs> by the way. Oh yeah. They, they had said hi before. <laughs> Old friend. Yeah. Uh, so could there ever be an extension for EF to do something similar? And I don't know. If, similar I, to I, what? I, I think they were talking about um, in the context of, of Dapper being yeah. you know, mm -hmm. stripped down and, and, uh, ah. and well, so there is a capability in, in Entity Framework to say, you know, I don't want you to trans, I don't want you to uh, do the translation. I'm going to give you the SQL directly. So you can kind of override um, how its default behavior of doing that is by, by feeding it um, t SQL for queries, um, or even SQL for, you know, just commands like, you know, an update or something like that commands going in there. So the general guidance, not just mine, uh, and also kind of applies in programming, right, is let EF do it, right? Just, just write it the easy way. Look at the performance, look for the places where, you know, entity, because most of the time entity framework is going to write way better SQL than I ever will. <laughs> no question about that. Um, but, you know, do it, the, write the easy code, which is create a link query and let entity framework do all the rest of the work, right? Then profile your application and look to see where there are performance issues and, you know, let somebody with database expertise look at the SQL and say, you know, and say, oh yeah, that's slow because this is just like this, oh my gosh, that the SQL it came up with, this is terrible, right? So let's just use um, direct T SQL, right? Let, let's just send that. Like, so you can do that within a framework and it still takes advantage of um, its knowledge of the, um, uh, the objects, your you know your classes, what their their um, schema of the classes is. It still takes advantage of the fact that it will still build the command, build the connection, execute the command, bring the data back. Right, it does all that stuff. That given, um, there's still even when you're feeding it directly, there's still 
a little more, you know, it still has to go through a lot of places, a lot of logic, even if it goes, nope, it's going to skip that. Do you need to do this? Nope, going to skip that. Then Dapper would be doing in that case. And there have been plenty of times where I've uh, recommended just using um, a hybrid solution, right? Like just, you know, use use Dapper where, you know, there's there's some place where it's just the really, really critical, like, you know, 90% of the activity in my application is here and it's happening so much. And, you know, we just want it, you know, t just tweaking the performance isn't enough. We really want it down. So, you know, use Dapper there. So I've done that. So you know, funny you should mention that, and and uh, I apologize to to our to our guests. I'm going to skip around the questions a little bit. We had another question come in that I think is actually relevant to to that train of thought. Um, <laughs> Troy, <at> that too. <laughs> yeah, Troy asks about you know should you be using EF on small projects with minimal database transactions or is that irrelevant? Um, are, mm, I would not say that that's relevant. Entity framework still is very powerful and the performance is still very, very good and gets better and better with each iteration of Entity Framework. I think people are really surprised. Um, people who looked at Entity Framework, you know, back in 2010, now they look at it today and they're like, holy smokes, that's changed a lot because, you know, people kind of went in a framework and never looked at it again. So the performance of that for, of any framework and now EF core five is amazing. Like they, it, they're constantly improving it. Um, so I wouldn't say, you know, as a general rule, oh, big projects, you know, use Dapper. I really, really think use what's e easiest for you to use. And then uh, when, you know, cause, cause with Dapper, you still need to know how to, Write SQL, write really, you know, the point of that is to write really good SQL. Right? Rather than so, relying on the tooling. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, there's uh, several other questions. I'm gonna throw one of them up and then just acknowledge that we saw it. Um, and this is kind of a beyond the scope of our discussion here. Um, what I would encourage for this question, and they're, they're asking, how can I integrate a location service? Uh, like if I have a website and I want to add some service that can show restaurants near me, you know, based on my my proximity. I think this is something that you should try to prototype yourself and then maybe put an ask out on Stack Overflow. Um, I mean, we, we, we can get into lots of conversations here and, and the entire show could be dedicated to implementing this and the architectural decisions made and how to model it and structure it. Um, so we're gonna move past that one. I just, I just you to wanna know. say one thing about that though. Mm -hmm. You can certainly integrate that kind of information in your queries. Right. Absolute, if you're using yes. entity framework in that service, so you can pass the, you know, whatever your location data is up to that service and, 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 you know, uh, using variables have entity framework incorporate. I'm, I'm assuming that's what the question might be about because we're talking about entity framework. So you can have an entity framework build up a query that has variables in it. Right. So, so, um, so you can plug the location into the query and then it will give you back just those restaurants. Absolutely. And then we got another one here and they're basically saying that Microsoft Docs state uh, that we don't recommend attempting to move from EF6 to EF core unless there's a very compelling reason. So is there any compelling reasons that you could think of, Julie, that you might want to share, uh, you know, comparison and contrasting uh, the pros and cons of EF6 versus EF core. And, and before you before you answer that, Julie, I, I think that kind of plays in a little bit to what you were just talking about a second ago. You were mentioning that that EF core has had the performance on EF core has really kind of stepped up a little bit. Um, so I, I don't know if this is is related to that. So that would certainly be something to keep in mind. Um, and I just want to back up and make sure everybody understands why this is even a statement, which is that EF core was a complete rewrite of entity framework from the ground up. So it's not just like an update that's backwards compatible. There's a lot of things that work differently. There's the, the basic concepts are all still there of, of how it works, but there's just no way you can just 
assume that it's just all going to work unless you have a really, really super simple thing. So uh, I just wanted to mention that's why uh, we are considerate of this. So here's a compelling reason you want to be able to use something cross-platform, right? You don't want to be uh, relegated to Windows or Windows servers. Um, you know, maybe you want to write a service that uses any framework and you want to have it um, in, you know, in a whole bunch of Docker uh, containers managed by Kubernetes, right? So there's EF core is uh, just like .NET core, it's cross-platform. Um, EF6 is open source and it was actually one of the first uh, early Microsoft products to be open source. So that that won't be the compelling reason. Um, the uh, There's certainly other um, functionality and features um, because EF6 is still around and EF6 will still be maintained um, and accepting pull requests and things like that. But EF core is where all the innovation is going into. So I think it's more, you know, really looking at some of the big differences uh, between EF core and EF6 and, you know, saying, whoa, we really need that. Like just a silly one, I not silly to some people, but um, one of the providers, I, I hinted at this before, one of the providers for EF core that Microsoft created is for uh, Cosmos DB, which is a document database, right? So people say, but it's not a relational database. Why do you need an ORM, you know, which is whole an object relational mapper for that? And the big reason is because there's so many people who are really familiar with how to use Entity Framework and they want to, they want to use uh, Azure Cosmos DB and they don't want to have to learn a whole new set of APIs. So that's just a, you know, Probably not the reason you're going to go for it, though. And you can so, still use EF6 with .NET 5, right? Yes, um, because when Windows and WPF were moved to .NET Core 3, the team made brought EF6 on top of um, .NET, you know, .NET standard and what it needs to be supported by .NET Core 3, so that people who are bringing their applications over could bring the whole application because a lot of those Windows forms and WPF apps are also using EF6. Yeah. So once it was uh, able to be on EF Core, uh, on .NET Core 3, now it's also moving forward and still being compatible with .NET 5. And I'm actually, um, it's funny because there was a little, little part of me that said, wait a minute, .NET, yeah, .NET Framework is not working on .NET. I, I really haven't thought, looked at that with EF6. I'm just saying, yeah, it was on EF Core 3, so it should be okay. EF Core 5. But remember, .NET Framework is if, but I, oh, come on. It's Cam? okay, it's okay. We can, we can Somebody. check it out. <laughs> oh, no, man, I'm freaking out. So for .NET 5, dot, for .NET 5, if you want it to work, um, with EF6, um, you could use uh, Net Core 3.1 and Net Framework 4.61 and Net Standard 2.0. Like that's the compatibility tree that we're looking for. Um, we have uh, many more questions here in the chat, but um, I'll ask one before we move on to allowing you to share your screen and kind of getting into a, a bit more here. So uh, we did have this question. Um, what's the best way to handle multiple concurrent queries using tasks without getting the multiple readers or open error? Uh, I'm not sure if that's like an EF6 problem or if EF core solved that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, actually. Well, one thing to keep in mind is that EF6 and EF core do have async um, uh, methods for for link queries. So perhaps um, that might be it. I might be what you need to aim for. But that's something I actually like, I haven't encountered this question before, although it makes a lot of sense. I could absolutely see how we're using it. Oh, and we're already saying using tasks 
with, uh, you know, so there's something that you know, Raphael, that I don't know, which is there, it seems like you, if you're using tasks, then you are using a sync um, and you're getting this error and I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that something that you put in the connection string about uh, uh, what is that very long uh, or parallel? I I I remember yeah. that too. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. like a multiple. God, it's like a. It is like a multiple record I, set connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something. Uh, let me let me just. I gotta Google it. See, I don't know. I just have to. I I I know like enough to be dangerous, and then I have just to school Google the rest multiple multiple active result sets that's that's right. the one multiple yes. active result sets that's the um that yes yeah, we, we're sharing Nobaba your screen now too so they were seeing your oh, your search God. results sorry <laughs> um yeah so it's multiple active result sets is a connection string parameter that you need to ha you should be using in your connection string try that and see if the problem goes away or just go do a little research on that. Right. Yeah. I'm, I don't know everything. I'm not encyclopedic, but I do know like <laughs> have a little like, Oh, wait a minute. I remember that. It was funny camp. Cause you were doing the same thing. Juliepedia. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So uh, I understood that you had some stuff that you wanted to potentially share uh, on your well, screen. Yes. Yeah, since this is about the docs. Um, I want to do a little bragging on behalf of my friends on the Entity Framework team, what they've done with the docs. Now I can't see, I'm assuming you're sharing this now. This was a really big thing that um, Jeremy, now it occurs to me, like with Rachel Apple, <laughs> Rachel Appel, uh, my friend Jeremy, who I have never met in person, I have never heard anybody say his last name. Lickness. 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 Thank Lickness. you. My friend, whose name I can't pronounce. So we're, there we go. High five, Cam. Um, <laughs> anyway, so this is one of Jeremy's bit when he first became the program manager for data, which includes Entity Framework. Uh, this was one of his big projects, which was to um, make kind of the the access into the, the starting point for the Entity Framework docs more organized and accessible. So this was, um, so I don't know how much, I, I know that the EF team works a lot on the on the docs. I don't know how much work and that's the what docs I was gonna, team does and that's on what it. I, I was gonna say, because uh, the EF team is responsible for the documentation, in this case, the engineering team. Why? Um, I mean, they know it, they know it better than resources. Anybody, right? Yeah, re resources. Okay. Um, anyway, so I just, you know, wanted to brag about the fact that they, you know, this kind of starting point does make it a little easier to like, you know, uh, a where do you want to go kind of format, right? You trying to get started with any frame or core, or, or you learn to want to learn how to persist and retrieve relational data with the EF core. Was that the um, Microsoft Learn stuff you were just showing us? Mm -hmm. That's the, the thing, thing that, that leads that, right yep. to there, right? That's so the thing Scott and I wrote, oh, is there, is there any video? Thing. Is there any video content on this hub? I'm wondering. Oh, oh no! You just need to go to Plural Site. Well, no, no, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. no. I'm no, teasing. Not... I'm teasing. Um, is, is I don't there, know, there, is, but but this is a really good example that you've just published. Um, this documentation, but it's not it's not documentation. I mean, that's actually kind of the point, right? You've got this good learning tool, and now. That's here. It's not just, you know, standard documentation. Um, another thing I really like what they did. Oh, let's go back to your question about videos. I'm sorry. I was just kind of teasing there. Well, I was teasing too, because it's a loaded question. The, there's a, there's a, a EF core 101 series on channel nine that um, I uh, actually recorded. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, <bravo. laughs> A, a much uh, younger looking version of Cam, no? no. Well, it was only a year and a half ago, so <laughs> probably. <laughs> that would be probably under dot dot net slash videos. Oh yeah, yeah. That makes sense. So anyway, I just wanted to, you know, point out that they've really got this kind of task based um guide, right? When you just go to like docs.microsoft.com slash EF and my of course 
goes to the U.S. version of it, U.S. English version of it. Uh, but it's it's kind of task based guidance. Um, I mean, once you get in, go into it, then of course um, you know you're in the standard documentation. And the other thing I want to point out is that the team has been amazing and very very transparent about um, what what they're working on. So, for example. Um, uh, releases and planning section, right? I don't know if you remember, any, any framework core three uh, was kind of this foundational version of entity framework where they said, look, you know, we've, we've got to batten down the hatches again in order for us to be able to continue evolving this in, in a good way. So rather than being filled with features, there's like seven new features, Instead, they, you know, they had to make a lot of changes that created a lot of breaking changes and they listed them very clearly. So it's not just like, OK, here's the thing. If you look at it, each each and every one of them has great description, what it used to be like, what it's like now, what's the breaking behavior, why they did it. Right. It's really explaining their uh, reasoning and also mitigations. In other words, uh, what can you do to deal with this problem if you're if you're updating? And this so this was from this isn't about EF six to EF core. This was going from EF core two to EF core three. Um, EF core five is not you know so EF core five is now taking advantage of all that work. So uh, the last time I looked at the breaking changes, there was one thing listed. Oh, there's a I guess it's so, been a while, let, but let me, a lot of the edge cases. Let me ask real quick. So EF Core Five, um, that's that's the next uh, that's the next version of EF, and that's coming out with .NET Five. Is that is exactly that right? in November? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and so, I think for for folks that like that maybe don't understand the naming, only like .NET Five is changing, like the changing the name from .NET Core to just .NET, but the components like ASP.NET and EF are still called, like they still have core in the name. So it's gonna be EF core, ASP.NET core. Yeah, that would be really NF5. confusing otherwise if they went back to EF. Yeah, yes. Right, because <laughs> Entity Framework is, <coughs> excuse me. Bless you. Oh, I almost fell off of my uh, treadmill when I did that too. Take care there. <laughs> um, so yeah, because Entity Framework and Entity Framework core are very different uh, frameworks, I guess, is the right, you know, so to, to take the word core out of the entity framework would be really confusing. So, yeah, I think that was a, a very good decision. It was probably not uh, come too easily because naming is it's not hard. just naming is hard, right? <laughs> but also it, it has such impact everywhere right well, so and, yeah. and we wouldn't i mean let's be honest we wouldn't be microsoft if we didn't give it a confusing name right <laughs> and or, or, saying we answer like their question about ef core naming so that's good yeah <laughs> yeah well also you know we skipped from ef core 3 to ef core 5 we've done that before the very it's first version of entity framework was just ef and then the very next one was ef4 and that was because .NET four frame .NET framework four was coming out, and they wanted to have an alignment, and that's what they're doing here again. They're yeah. since .NET Core is jumping from three to five, EF Core is jumping also, so people understand. The other really nice thing, though, is that you could still use EF Core five with .NET Core three. You don't have to move to .NET five. Interesting. Uh, so yeah. .NET Core three point one, I should I should say. So that's the long termer. Long so there's term. EF Core five, EF six. That's all you EF need to know. Core, yeah, yeah. That's all you need to know now. But <laughs> like, yeah, the evolution of jumping back with names and it's it's fun. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have next year. We're gonna have EF six and EF Core six. Right, right. right. Yeah, that's gonna be weird. Right, when .NET, because the .NET six. Yeah. Does that, so that mean Core EF... will be important? Well, Maybe. Well, is. Well, 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 I was just going to say, you... hear, hear me out. Maybe, maybe we should have, um, maybe we should have iterated everything to ten, like the Windows team did, right? <laughs> just jump everything right up. Oh You'd God, that's going to make first. me feel so old. Oh, we're running framework for ten. Yeah, let me go get my dentures out. 
Come on, you've all seen the gif of the the old lady blowing out her 100 year birthday candles. And I've, I've never teeth, seen a gif before. What's her that? I've seen gifs. Fly out. GIF. Oh, oh. <laughs> am I on camera? You can't see the gesture I'm making, right? <laughs> Let's see if we can find it. Come on, that'll be the last thing I when I'm going to be remembered for on this particular show. We should go but, there. We should totally do tabs versus spaces now. Let's see. Where is it? I'm going to find it. Are, are you showing my screen? <laughs> yeah, we are showing oh your my screen, gosh! So. Okay, where is it? Uh, all right, got it. I got to Google. Hopefully, not the inappropriate will pop. <laughs> this is what we do. This is how we stay sane. <laughs> Oh, come on. There it oh, is. There it is. Um, <laughs> there goes... <laughs> is that that wonderful? Oh, only on the .NET doc show. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There we go. Back to, you know, plan for entity framework core 5.0. <laughs> Thank you for letting me share my screen. I'm not allowed to do that in my plural site courses, of oh. course, because, you know, licensing and, and legal stuff. Oh, this is funny. Oh, cool. <laughs> Can you tell? I've yeah, I've been home a long time. I'm just hanging out with you guys. Yeah, let's look at some jiffies together. Wait, everybody. Wait, jiffies. <laughs> well, no, it's jiffy.com. Okay, peanut butter. Yeah. I'm, Are you guys is, drunk? Oh, I wish. No, <laughs> this is funny. Okay, come on, let's go back. Live to, video. I'm gonna go back to uh, Streamyard so I can see. Uh, how crazy the comments are they're they're having fun it, this is a <laughs> it is it's entertaining um oh all right nothing uh there's people talking still about the async stuff there's a bunch about the additional um database context and how to share it in a parallel sense with you know concurrency across multiple requests and uh thread safe manners and stuff like that so there's a bunch yeah. of stuff there um otherwise they're they're just entertained by our giphy searches and stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, does that mean time's up anyway? No. <laughs> run out. Do you have any more? Oh, I lost my train of thought so many times. Questions about entity framework. Um. So where were we? So I, I, I guess I've got some general questions. So like, how many? Like, I know that you have been a developer for a really long time, and you've have all this amazing experience with it. You've been following like the evolution of entity framework. Um. Like, so what? uh you know like real world problems have you solved using this like any examples of you know you know huge applications or anything like that anything at scale i'm just kind of curious well one of the things that i get a lot from uh clients who come to me for entity framework issues is usually a performance problem and then half of the time that's because they're using lazy loading and don't know how it works and they you know, created all kinds of problems. Oh, that sounds interesting. But, so what's lazy loading? First of all, that's, that's like a, a thing we should probably dive into a little bit, right? Um, no, I don't like lazy loading. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's when you, uh, instead of explicitly asking for data, uh, you have some data and then you want the related data and you just let it magically go get that data. And the, and the big issue, uh, the most common problem I've seen, um, it's like an N plus one problem where you have, for example, your parent objects, like you know, your, your key objects, you've got them in a, uh, an ASP.NET grid, ASP.NET core, right? You've got a data grid and you want to show the parent data and, and also a little bit of child data. Maybe you've got sales orders, and you want to see the uh, total from the de the de the line items, right? But you didn't bring in the line items. You just asked for the sales orders, and then you told the grid to show me the sales orders and the total for the sales orders line items for the line items summary of each of the sales orders. And what lazy loading? I just saw that it's Julie effect. <laughs> Sorry. So what lazy loading will do is it'll start populating the grid. It'll go, okay, here's the first sales order. Oh, wait, I have to go get the summary of the line items. Go get the line items for that sales order. Okay, filled out the top line. Next one, go get the details, come back. Next one, right? It's doing it as it's loading the grid. So lazy loading, as much as I dislike it, has been um, 
good for my bank account. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. Uh, but but another another interesting thing, though, with those kinds of problems, not not just the lazy loading, but performance problems is maybe somebody will build like this crazy long um, query, you know, like very clever. They figured out how to traverse all the navigations and they're just what you know, SQL Server to just do all of it, just bring back all the data at once. But it's many levels of this eager loading using include. So it's, you know, bringing the sales order, uh, all the sales or, you know, like um, all the sales orders from this month or whatever, and all their line items and all the product information and uh, all the category information. Um, and, and when you're using the eager loading, it gets entire objects, right? So you know, they write these big, huge things. And then the, um, they'll be like, oh, it's really, really slow, right? Uh, something's wrong. So they look at their SQL profiler and actually the SQL part was kind of fast, right? So the problem is somewhere in between asking any framework to execute that link query and the SQL being sent to the database or once the data is returned, then transforming it back into all the objects and relationships and everything. So sometimes the solution to that is just, uh, well, uh, sometimes it might be using some, um, uh, your own SQL or using a view, right? Or sometimes it's breaking the query apart into multiple queries because it's easy to do this part, right? Comes back and now, do the second part, right? Instead of sending all of it at once and it takes a while and it comes back. So people don't think about, you know, like, oh, but two queries, that's so much more work. But sometimes two queries might actually be a lot easier and then and then fix things up on the other end. But you could also, you know, like I said, maybe, you know, sometimes it's solved by saying, hey, I want to use a view. Right, like I, I'm going to build this directly into my database because the data. This is what the database is good at, right? And I'm just going to have a view, and then I'm just going to ask Entity Framework to use the view instead of um, building up some SQL. So that's always fun to do. I like literally fun. I like I I I like doing that. You know, the code reviews and um, and helping people find those problems, especially when it's successful. I once was brought in to work with a client. Uh, they engaged me for three days. I went to Ohio and, you know, so I was there for three days. Well, we got it all sorted out after the first day. And the owner of the company said, if you want to go home tonight, we'll still, we're still happy to pay you for the whole three days, <laughs> right? Wow. Which was pretty cool. Uh, but I what actually what I did was said, oh, well, as long as we got this extra time, if you want to, can we Talk about the architecture of your application that I witnessed <laughs> while we were looking. So we spent a couple of days after that doing uh, uh, modeling and using doing some domain-driven design techniques and things like that. So that was pretty awesome. That's an amazing story. I love it. So one of the things that you mentioned, and I just want to double click on real quick, was you talked earlier about Dapper and how like you have to have like this innate knowledge uh, of SQL to like actually put those SQL query strings into as a parameter. Um, and with EF, you're kind of alluding to the fact that you almost don't need that much knowledge, but if you have it, it's great because you can kind of fine tune things. Is that right? Have it or have access to it, right? Okay. Like I don't, I don't, I'm not going to depend on myself to gain that knowledge after 30 years, right? If I'm not a DBA expert, you know, I, I'm like, I'll leave that to people with that expertise. So um, I think it's really important always to do that kind of profiling on your applications with using Entity Framework or some something else. Um, and, you know, if you don't have somebody with that expertise on your team, hire somebody out, like get a contractor just to come in and, and do that kind of analysis. I think it's really important. Um, another really important tip, and this isn't just Entity Framework again, but it is with regards to getting data in and out of your applications is um, a lot of times people will do all of their performance testing against their development database with 15 records in it. Right. And maybe the first year, maybe it's a brand new application in the first year, you've got a couple thousand. Right. But then as it grows, the performance gets slower and slower and slower. Right. Because they weren't 
testing for load, that, like to just anticipate that. That that's why that's why for the .NET Doc Show we do all our testing in production. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> That is a true statement. Um, that's awesome. So we've got about five minutes before we wrap up for uh, our show today. Um, and you've been providing so much uh, knowledge here. Is there any other like, you know, primary tidbits of information our viewers could, should walk away with? Um, uh, um, <laughs> I'm actually kind of looking at the, at the comments. Do you want to uh, hit, hit some of those or? Sure. Uh, David had a good one there. Um, he says, I see that your latest book is from 2012. Do you recommend your up-to-date Pluralsal courses over or is it still relevant? Uh, the, so the latest books were, yeah, I, I, writing books is so hard and so time consuming and our technology is just changing too quickly. So I have focused all of my efforts on either writing articles or plural sites. So my plural site courses are absolutely up to date. As a matter of fact, the last pair of books was EF4, Entity Framework 4. So way before Entity Framework Core. Now, if you are somebody who really, really likes books, like needs books, um, uh, there's, uh, oh my God, this, I hate when this happens. Uh, it's brain F asterisk RT <laughs> on the name of my friend who has written a great entity framework core book. Um, and he's my friend and I am, and you his blank. name is John and, uh, and I'm completely, oh my gosh. Yes. John P. Smith, entity framework core in action. Very, very good. So if you need books, I that's the book I would recommend. And he's, you know, he keeps them up to date and they're there. His knowledge is very, very deep. Um, and, you know, if you like videos, you've got, you know, Microsoft Learn and dot dot net cams videos or my videos on Pluralsight. Um, so, you know, and also I, I do uh, write articles and stuff. For example, there's um, every, Every time there's a big update to .NET, Code Magazine uh, has a special issue on that. And so uh, they've got one coming up for .NET 5, and I've got an article in there on Entity Framework Core 5. So that, you know, so I'd love to write, right? But just not books anymore. It's too much. But John's, yeah, John's books are really great. Well, Highly recommended. Well, and you mentioned your Pluralsight courses. I went ahead and threw your oh, okay. Pluralsight URL up there for folks. Awesome. And you have to, you're working on two new ones coming yeah, up. Yeah, well, right? two big updates. So yeah. um, the domain driven design fundamentals or fundamentals of domain driven design that Steve Smith and I did, we did that in 2014. Now, it's not uh, tech, the topic is not really technology specific, uh, but, um, you know, we still used um, uh, Visual Studio, what, 2015? 13 and uh you know asp.net i don't know what version and maybe yeah. ef6 whatever so and also it's in the old you know old style of plural site stuff so we're updating that but it's not just making new slides we're uh still going through it to say okay you know we talked about this but since then you know our ideas have evolved and you know so so we're doing that update and at the same time i'm also updating the uh my getting started with the entity framework core course which is currently for 3.1 and i'm updating it for ef core 5 so some of the stuff i will not be able to record until after ef core 5 has released and you know i'm using the preview version of visual studio and i have to block <laughs> out that little preview and <laughs> right but then but then there's the issue of um, like if you're using NuGet package manager uh, to you know pull in packages and all the versions are like you know 5.0.0-RC1-8754924, you know, so I don't, you know, I'm just going to, so I'm doing as much as I can um, and then I'll do the rest after it gets released. Yeah, that's the hardest part about about video uh, content is that it gets it gets dated right away with version yep. numbers. Uh, or yep. 
Awesome. Well, this has been amazing. I appreciate you coming on so much. I've learned a ton. Uh, I've learned about ORMs and entity framework and like the evolution of where it's been and where it's going. Very, very much appreciative. Um, tune in next week with our guest, uh, Claire, who's going to be talking about open source software and the .NET Foundation. I think it's going to be a great episode. Oh, yeah, I bet. Yeah, thank awesome. you so much. It was really fun to talk with you guys. And uh, oh, gosh, you people. <laughs> I'm out of guy. Okay. I'm out of guy. Really I also say that all the time. And I yeah, it's really bubble. funny. But I hear myself saying it now, and I'm like, oh, I know. Anyway, I but same. it was really great to hang out, and I, and I really appreciate that you you know wanted to chat with me and and talk about this stuff. Well, we would so, love to have you back sometime, Julia. Yeah, I, 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 I regret not having talked to you in like four years now. So um. yeah, we, we can't all do all the things, can we? <laughs> all right. And thanks everybody for uh, for being here and um, you know asking all your great questions. And there's a lot of engagement today, so kudos yeah. for that. That's awesome. Super. A lot of positive feedback. So. Awesome. All right. Well, thank uh, you, everyone. Everybody, see you next week. Special time Bye. next week with our show with Claire. Yeah. Um, so. Bye. Yep. Take care.